Hey everyone, Peter's Man coming at you, and hope this video finds you doing super well. Now this video is going to be all about VR hand tracking from your hands to a little bit on the knuckles, which we'll talk about at the end of the video. I literally just got these guys, and this video is from me playing around with it for the first time. But this video is thanks to you guys for smashing the like button. We got well over the 50 likes needed, and I'm super stoked about that and to be making this video. Now, what I wanna go ahead and do is for this video, let me set a like goal of 75 likes. And if we can do that, I'll go ahead, see if we can get someone from HTC to talk about hand tracking, especially on the development side of things for the Vive, Vive Pro, and Vive Cosmo, since they now have an early access SDK that works across all those different headsets. No promises, even if we do hit the 75 likes that I can make that happen. If not, don't worry, don't worry about that. We can go ahead and I'll probably do some other development tutorial, maybe a little bit on VRPK, just because I've been playing around with that a lot. Couple really quick things before we start this video. Number one is if you haven't watched Mike Algar's video on VR design, please stop watching this video we'll still be here and go ahead watch that I'll leave a link to that in the iCard as well as in the description for you to check it out the second thing is that this video is purely in my own opinions on what I think works well what I think doesn't work well with hand tracking especially given the technology as it is today and that said I look at this video then more as guidelines than it is rules the code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. So, for example, some of the limitations regarding field of view that we'll talk about later might not apply into the future, especially if we're looking into 2020 and 2021 of VR. So those are the type of things that I just wanted to mention really early on are kind of, as you go through this video, keep that in mind. If there are things you disagree with, that's totally fine. Let me know in the comments below. That out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about hand tracking design. Now, when talking about design, it's so important to talk about specifically who is your audience. And these are kind of the three questions that you need to ask. Who will be using what I'm building, whatever the application might be? Why will they want to use it? And how will they go about using it? Now, this how question is going to be more important to us specifically when we talk about kind of design regarding the technology side of things. But all three of those questions are super valuable to address when building pretty much anything. So obviously this is gonna be very different from application to application, but in a very concrete terms, let's, we can quickly take an education example. So let's say we're trying to build a chemistry application to teach kids maybe from age 10 to 13, 14, you're gonna have to define that clearly. Just some very basics about grabbing chemicals and then combining them to create a compound. So literally, we, we've defined a lot of things there. We added who is the audience, we haven't asked, answered why, but why is fairly obvious is to create something that's a little bit more immersive. Obviously, that does kind of lead to the fact that we want some, maybe some more sparkly visuals, something that really makes things concrete as to, I do this and this and it becomes this. And so kids start to learn those types of concepts. And we've also answered the how, which is quite literally, let's say we have a bucket, we go grab oxygen here, we go grab hydrogen here, and we toss it maybe into our pool that we're playing around with, and combine like one, two, three, connect, connect the lines because that's also important to learning how that chemistry works. There, you've kind of created something that's a little more interactive than say maybe pen and paper and something that you can now start to do in 3D applications. Now, I mean, chemistry is one of those applications that is kind of trivial in the sense that a lot of people have thought, have thought about that in their early days of VR. But still, I think ha having that concrete and knowing those input mechanisms will help you go even further steps into how you actually make the hand tracking be super useful, which we'll talk about next. But again, this applies to pretty much anything, whether that's gaming, whether that's out of home entertainment, whether that's social VR, you name it. Answering these questions typically is what enables you to basically figure out how these hands are gonna be used, and then you can go think about now, what would be the best way for me to use the hands, which we'll talk about right now. So now that we've talked a little bit about our audience and the use case that we're trying to build, let's talk about how we can make hand tracking feel good. Now, obviously this is gonna depend on the type of technology, but what I'm kind of trying to do is just in the bare bones application, you have two hands that are getting tracked with computer vision, and how can we use that scenario to our advantage to make something that really feels immersive. So these are my six guidelines, three do's that you 
you want to do for hand tracking, and three don'ts that you might want to try and avoid. Again, these are purely guidelines, but I think they'll help guide how you think about developing and designing interactions with hand tracking. So the first do that I have is design around the fact that you have no haptic feedback. Outside of maybe a couple gestures like the pinch, although personally I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about why I don't like the pinch, but outside of a couple maybe self-haptic feedback, you don't get the same thing that you do with a controller per se, where you can touch a button and you have the controller vibrate in your hands and you get the visual effect. Really, you're only dealing with the visual effects that happen from using your hands to cause actions in a VR world. So some examples of how you might go about avoiding this haptic feedback is, for example, if I use the force to grab an object and pull it closer to me. So basically, it's literally just two gestures, your hand fully faced out like this and then a grab. You can go from there to, to get the force that needs to be exerted on whatever objects people are trying to play around with. Other things, of course, are pointing. So kind of pointing at different things, but even in the more visual sense of if you're try trying to touch a button, for example, even like, let's say there's a button right here, I'm gonna go ahead, press it. If you've checked out Mike Alger's video, you'll see that you can create emphasis by very simply changing color, adding audio to really make it feel that even though you don't have haptic feedback, which is kind of to be expected, I mean, I don't think most people will expect to, have to feel the force when they, they don't have anything to give them that. But in those scenarios, you can use these other cues to really add a little bit, but also compensate for the fact that you ha don't have haptic feedback. Second do that I have is make use of your fingers more than you use your hands. Now I'm gonna make this distinction here because I think it's pretty important. I mean, if you ever think about how we interact with things on a daily world, we actually use our fingers a lot. If you think keyboard, it's more than our hands moving like this, it's our fingers moving like this. Even with a mouse, most of the input ends up from the, happening because of the clicks on the mouse. And really you can extend that. And the reasoning is moving your fingers takes a lot less energy than moving your hands does. And I mean, that's just a fact. You're moving more mass here to get to basically do the same thing. So any chance you can do to use fingers as opposed to hands will allow your users and anyone running in your application to stay in that application for minutes, if not hours longer, because they're using a lot less energy. And you can do a lot of really cool things, whether that's gestures, whether that's pointing, and all of that doesn't require immense hand movement. It allows your arms to pretty much stay close to your body, which is ideal for being lazy. And going back to Mike Alger's video, which basically <laughs> humans are lazy, that's just kind of a fact of life and anything that we can do to minimize the amount of energy that we're using in any application really goes a long way to allowing people to stay there for longer. And the longer they stay, the longer they're more excited to use your app, the better your app performs and it's just a win-win all around and there's nothing better than a win-win. <laughs> the third and final do on my list is to build around precision. Now, what do I mean by that? So there are various types of positions when we talk about hand tracking. Obviously, there's position of where your hands and fingers are. They might not always exactly be one-to-one, -one, although the technology will continually be getting better to make that slightly more possible with each and every year. But there are also limitations with regards to field of view. You don't want your hands to just disappear from the field of view and lose tracking so that when I go to grab something that's slightly out of field of view, I can't grab it. That's just not a good user experience. Going back to the fin finger example here, we don't really know the difference between 45 degrees, 46 degrees, and I mean, that precision is kind of not baked into our hands. When we're thinking about having our fingers be pointers, for example, don't just have a ray cast line that goes and tries to figure out what object someone is trying to hit. Instead, think about ways that you can avoid that scenario. So for example, maybe you have a cone ray cast that comes off the finger and that allows them to more easily interact with 3D objects that are further out for them. At the same time, you can also consider when you're doing gestures, for example, maybe in the self-haptic feedback instance of a pinch. So for me, whenever I use this on a HoloLens, it maybe clicks 25% of the time if I'm lucky. Instead, try to optimize your gestures such that this pinch basically, even if it's a little bit off and you have a little bit of space, or maybe it's overcompensated in your 3D model and representation of hand tracking, you can actually go ahead, still recognize that as a pinch, and now you've left a room for error, which any user will always appreciate. The first don't I have on my list is avoid at all costs hand-to-hand -hand interactions. 
And this is just purely because of the state of the technology. Unfortunately, occlusion areas like this basically mean that it's very hard for the cameras to figure out which hand is which and ultimately lead to losing at least sight of one hand. Oftentimes, you'll end up losing sight of both hands. And when you've lost data, you're not able to interact and that's never a good time. So you want to design in ways such that you don't have to interact with your hands. So if we take something that's kind of close to that, you end up having the, the hand tracking work a lot better. So if we say have a radial button here or just some buttons on the side of our hands, a very simple example is put the buttons on the inside of the hand as opposed to the outside of the hand. The reason for that is if I go over here to interact with the buttons, now I've lost sight of this hand, so that's basically gone, and then of course all my buttons will disappear because of the fact that they were tied to the hand in and of itself. But if you have it on the inside of the hand, you now can put these buttons here. I still have tracking of the finger because that's not occluded. I still have tracking of this hand because that wasn't occluded. And it's a very simple thing, but goes a long way to avoiding this occlusion instance. And designing around the technology like that, while not ideal, is something we're gonna have to do. And it's so simple if you really think about it. Just put buttons right here and you've, you've avoided the entire problem. But sometimes it's something you might think about a little too late. And once you're so far along in the design process, it's sometimes hard to come back to these earlier steps. So just thinking about the way that you can have this technology and the simple problem of occlusion and designing around that is a really good thing that you need to do and just don't have situations where you're occluding your hands, period. The second don't I have is avoid moving your hands around very quickly. And this is again tied to the technology. The problem is oftentimes the hand tracking is running typically in the best case scenario, it's running at 60 frames per second, and that's if it can get this data pretty smoothly. The second you're kind of moving it around like this, it's very hard for the cameras to keep track of it. It's really hard for the machine learning to keep track of it, and it might end up dropping you down to 30 frames per second just so that it can slowly move it, but that's a little jarring. So you want to design around the fact that you want users' hands to move kind of slowly. They're not going to be doing crazy Beat Saber-esque movements left and right, but instead maybe just either whether that's a force grab or whether that is literally just a point, something very small, and you wanna kind of guide your users to not move in this kind of crazy fast and all over the place directions. The last tip I have, and this is it's kind of a cheesy don't, but it's basically don't have your any users whatsoever ever zombie hand like this. And uh, that's just the term I'm gonna use to refer to it, but literally it's such an annoyance as a user to have hand tracking put my arms at arm's length here in order to get it to work, and then I'm kind of playing around in this area. It's just extremely draining on your shoulder here, and that's kind of the big culprit. With kids, you might be able to get away with it a little bit more because their arms are a lot shorter, but even then, I just really don't recommend this. Have basically have it such that it's at elbow's length, tied to the body, that way gravity is working with you and it's again goes back to one of the earlier points it just minimizes the amount of energy that you have and it's again something that you don't want users to constantly be doing this the probably only one example is if you're doing some sort of fitness training game where they're like have weights in their hands or some crazy stuff like that and then it's just a, a timing issue of how long it takes until their hands drop but outside of maybe that like one example let's let's try to avoid that scenario where you're zombie handing left and right just to get the hand tracking to work so that pretty much covers the six design guidelines that I had. Again, love to hear feedback from you guys on what you would add to this list, what you wouldn't add to this list. But the last thing I wanna do to wrap up this video is talk very quickly about basically these Knuckles controllers and having it moving into the future, having a way of either having hand tracking that uses a hand or hand tracking that uses a glove, kind of a hybrid version, which is like this Knuckles here where it's kind of in between. It gets some hand tracking, but it's not exactly a glove per se. But what the main takeaway I want to say at this end of the video is when you're developing, make your hand tracking systems very agnostic to the type of device input that you're getting. It doesn't matter if you're getting it from SteamVR through, through the knuckles, or it doesn't matter if you're just getting it through computer vision through, say, an Oculus Quest. Both of these are practically the same when you're trying to design for 
any application. And again, in most applications, if you're trying to hit the widest audience, you're gonna wanna design for pure hand tracking where you don't have per se the buttons here or this joystick to add to the extra input. You're typically just gonna, gonna do this and when you ever port it over to a Knuckles controller, you can still do the same interactions as long as you have a device agnostic way of getting that data. And that's something that I don't think will be stressed enough because literally as we go into end of 2020 and end to beginning of 2021, we're gonna start, I think, seeing a lot more different types of controllers or hand tracking solutions or some cross in between that I can't even think about yet. And being able to have code that's able to support all of these different platforms is such an important thing. And you can either use that through SDKs like VRTK or just have some small interface that you build in Unity just to help separate out the code. But I highly encourage if you're ever developing anything that uses hand tracking, please just make it super abstract and device agnostic. It'll save you so much time down the road. So yeah, that pretty much does it for this video. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. This has been Fuse Man and I'm signing out.